welcome to part three. Oh, note the dog on the right. Again, you can see how close the trails run to people's homes, and I'm very aware of the exhaust noise as we pass by. We pick up the trail some 200 metres further on from where he left us, as the cameras now decided to play with us again. Note the elevation figure on the right of 454 metres. As I mentioned at the end of part two, the trail is a bit wetter and we're heading down a fairly steep gradient. Rocks and roots are quite slippery from my wet tyres. The numerous rocks breaking through the surface of these ancient tracks are a challenging test in these moist conditions. The trail is narrowing again with more protruding rock. The grass is particularly treacherous when you're glancing off the hidden stones. A couple of the ridges across the trail are followed by steeper descents, so I take a pause to catch my breath and check my riding line. This engine stall was a continuing feature of this trip. It had not been an issue on previous ones, and initially I was blaming it on the hot conditions and my exhausted state, which meant my coordination was slipping a little. However, Richard had a different diagnosis, which we'll come to later. In these tight conditions, it's not just the ground that you have to be keeping your eye on. It is surprising how the forward view of the camera really mellows out the terrain. We've just dropped 30 metres in a little over 3 minutes. use this short rising piece of the trail to bring the bike to rest and take a brief look at the upcoming terrain. Relieved to have completed the descent without incident, I again take a short pause to catch my breath. It looks 
looks like the grass has been cut. So although it's wet, the visibility of the ground is at least better and we can move on faster. short distance of fairly flat ground we are starting to climb again. The grassy lane soon changed character and narrowing stone strewn tracks are again with us. In two minutes we've climbed nearly 50 metres in altitude. When assessing the tech track, the man in front told me to look for two things. Number one, how squiggly is the track line? And number two, look at the density of the topographic contour lines. They are a good indicator of the difficulty of the route. At this point I draw your attention to the track trace, or what's left of it, in the top left hand corner of the screen. Note the squiggly line towards the end of the trail. As you can see, the straight element of the track is easy riding. Again, the straight prop for this off-road section is also easy going. Now we are approaching the squiggly section. back to single track. At least it's a bit drier. See from the slope meter that the descent is quite steep, though the elevation doesn't seem to be keeping pace.
Oh, there's that stool again. The trail is so narrow in places that I must concentrate hard not to snag my boots on the moss covered rocks as I dab my way through. back out and it looks like plane sailing. In the distance I can see Richard has stopped and dismounted. Where is he? My riding for the last three kilometres has been more flowing and nearer to my usual rate of progress, which is pleasing considering my exhausted state. With a quick edit, you join us about 10 minutes after I stopped. Richard had come up against a fallen tree blocking our route, and while he was taking his bike around, I topped up on sorting nuts and water. We also decided that he would take my bike through to save my energy. I did buy him dinner later to say thanks. This little ridge was far steeper than it looks on camera. Richard identified that the throttle linkage had developed a little too much slack. That microsecond lack of response was probably why we were both stalling the bike so often. My familiarity over time had not picked up on the issue, but Richard making the immediate comparison to his bike saw it straight away. Great stuff. After a short conflam and a drop more water, we are ready to move on. See you in the next part. Thanks for watching.